introduce uh, this uh, 87th annual meetings um, speaker of the public lecture, uh, who's going to deliver the public lecture, uh, Professor Thomas Perdue. Um, I'm first of all very um, obliged and very um, deeply grateful to Professor Perdue for accepting our invitation to deliver this lecture. Um, let me introduce uh, Professor Perdue using his own words, and he says, I'm a philosopher of biology, particularly interested in immunology, microbiology, and developmental biology. He is a group leader in the French National Center for Scientific Research. Professor Perdue's uh, research focuses on biological identity, biological individuality, and the concept of the organism, the concept of development and microbial symbiosis. His thoughts on the philosophy of biology and theoretical biology and medicine have been published in such impactful journals as PNAS, Nature Reviews Immunology, and Lancet. He is the head of the Conceptual Biology and Medicine Group in the Immunology Unit of Bordeaux and the coordinator of the Institute of Philosophy in Biology and Medicine. He says, I'm interested in all forms of interdisciplinarity between the life sciences and the humanities. What is the definition of life? How are broad bodily systems delineated? How do the mind and the body interact? In a book published last year titled Philosophy of Immunology, uh, Dr. Perdue has considered the ways in which immunology can shed light on these and other important philosophical issues. His earlier book published about 10 years ago in 2012, titled The Limits of Self, uh, self Immunology, The Limits of the Self, Immunology and Biological Identity, has won the uh, Lakatos Award in 2015, which is given annually for an outstanding contribution to the philosophy of science. We now wait eagerly to listen to you, uh, to listen to you, Dr. Lou, uh, your responses to the question, why science needs philosophy. Thank you very much once again for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Professor Prado. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Madrindo, for this uh, very kind introduction. And really, I want to insist this is, uh, I mean, the honor is, is really mine. This is really a pleasure to, to talk to you and to share with you my thoughts on the connection between philosophy and science. I'm sure you have your own views about this question, and I think it's important to talk about that and to see how much we share in terms of uh, that, that question, which I think is a very important one. So my question indeed is um, why science needs philosophy? And um, as uh, Professor Majumdar just said, I'm a research professor at CNRS. I was trained in philosophy of science. And in 2014, I decided to join an immunology lab. So uh, a biology lab in Bordeaux with, uh, I would say, um, a biological daily life. So we have seminars in immunology. We work in immunology. We work about all sorts of topics which are directly uh, connected to the biology. And of course, what I'm trying to do in the lab is what I'm going to describe at a much more general level here, which is to try to connect the science and philosophy. The outline of my talk is going to be extremely simple. First, I want to convince you, and maybe you don't need to be convinced, but maybe other arguments can be put on the table. I would like to convince you that philosophy and science must reconnect. Second, I would try to show on the basis of some bibliometric evidence that we gathered recently in my lab that to some extent philosophy and science have reconnected or in fact were never completely divorced contrary to what many people tend to think. And third, and probably more importantly for you, I would like to give you one example in our lab of a connection between philosophy and science and in our case it's going to be it's very expected given that we are an immunology lab, but I want to give you one example of connection between philosophy on the one hand and immunology on the other. So first, philosophy and science must reconnect. I think there is a very important, uh, let's say, misunderstanding uh, in uh, science and especially 
which is to say that uh, many people tend to think that there is a divorce between science and philosophy. So very often, when I say to colleagues who don't know me yet that I am a philosopher embedded in a science lab, they are very surprised. They are like, what are you doing as a philosopher in a biology lab? And when I try to explain the kind of things they do, they tend to think, oh, in fact, you do science, you don't do philosophy. So there is this idea that we all know what science and philosophy are, and we all know that they are very different. In fact, for most of the history, philosophy and science have been associated. As you can see here on the left, they are not that different, and they have had some interactions and some cross-fertilizations. It's even more the case in many situations that, in fact, they are right, like, like here on the, on, the, on the left, on the bottom left, that the, the, the observation is that they, in fact, philosophy and science were even difficult to set apart. They're very difficult, in fact, to consider as two different things. For most of the history, philosophy and science were unified into a broad and coherent thinking, like thinking about the world, thinking about the way we think about the world, all that was part of one view about what we are and how we uh, know the world in which we live. In fact, the divorce between philosophy and science that most scientists consider as obvious is very recent. It's mainly starting from the 19th century that this divorce started. And there are many reasons for that divorce between, or pseudo-divorce between philosophy and science. One reason, which is absolutely obvious, is the increasing specialization of knowledge. It is almost impossible today to be a universal scholar, to know everything about everything. We are very impressed nowadays when we see a biologist who knows a lot about chemistry, or a physicist who knows a lot about biology or the social sciences. So it's very difficult to be um, someone who knows everything about everything, which used to be not possible, but not completely impossible in the past. The second reason is that when philosophers realized that they did not anymore have a good grasp on science, some of them started to say that philosophy was completely different from science. So there is really a responsibility also of philosophers, not just scientists, for saying that in fact, philosophy and science are completely different. Heidegger, for example, played a, a, an important role in suggesting that science and philosophy are very different and diverse. Here I'm focusing on the Western part of the world um, but I know that similar reflections apply and are relevant for Asia. It's just that my knowledge of Asia is not sufficient to give good examples of that. So many of my examples are going to be very Western in a way which I think should be complemented by other analysis. Still, I think the main idea remains um, a true, though, of course, you might tell me otherwise, and I would, I would be very, very interested in that. So, common misunderstanding is divorce between philosophy and science. There is, in fact, and we all know that, a long tradition of philosophers who are philosophers and scientists, and for whom it's very difficult to say whether they are philosopher or scientist. I mean, Aristotle is probably one of the most important biologists of the history of Western thought. Uh, Descartes is, of course, a, 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 a universal scholar who has made important contributions to mathematics, to physics, to uh, philosophy, uh, to biology. It's less clear because people often criticize his biology. But I mean, this is really important to see that these people on the screen, uh, uh, Leibniz, Pascal, uh, Russell, many others, and Einstein is also one example of someone who has that kind of very general view about the word, which make them some sort of philosophers, scientists together. Um, one thing which I think is important to realize is that, so it, it, even in recent times, I just mentioned Einstein, um, for example, Einstein insisted several times on the importance of history and philosophy for doing science itself. Einstein, in a letter to a young physicist who was full of doubts because that young physicist started to think that maybe 
he needed to do history and philosophy of science. And he was like, is that normal to do history and philosophy of science instead of physics? So he wrote to Einstein and Einstein was kind enough to reply. And in his response, Einstein writes, a knowledge of the historic and philosophical background gives that kind of independence from prejudice of his generation from which most scientists are suffering. This independence created by philosophical insight is, in my opinion, the mark of distinction between a mere artisan or specialist and a real seeker after truth. So that was in 1944. So we see here something which is very important. Scientists, when they want to think about their own domain, realize that history and philosophy of science count among the tools they are not the only ones, but they count among the tools that can be useful to think about the big picture of their own domain. If you want to think about mass, if you want to think about energy, thinking about the history of those concepts, how they change through history and how you can redefine them can be very important to introduce a new revolution or at least a new way of seeing things in your own domain here physics or relativity in the case of Einstein. This is not something which is unheard of uh, even recently in biology. For example, John Bonner, who did some very interesting work on many issues, including multicellularity development. He worked, for example, on slime molds, as many of you probably know. Uh, Bonner wrote in 2013 something which is not completely different. Many biologists, and I am one of them, live two lives at the same time. In one, they work day to day in the laboratory or in the field. This is what keeps them in touch with their subjects, the real world that they find so fascinating. The other life, so the second life, is a concern for the big picture, how it all fits together. And I think that is exactly the kind of things that we are talking about here. Scientists very often care about the big picture and when they care about the big picture, very often they come back to questions which are related to history and philosophy of their own domain or history of philosophy itself much more generally. This interdisciplinary tradition is still alive as illustrated, for example, by a major theoretical physicist, Carlo Rovelli, who um, did this very nice intervention talk at London School of Economics in 2016, I think, uh, um, and, and that was entitled Why Physics Needs Philosophy. And Carlo Rovelli, as I said, a major theoretical physicist, shows in detail how the most important physicists in the 19th and 20th century were inspired by philosophy at different degrees and in different ways. And I think his talk and the related paper published in 2016, I think are really wonderful if you want to get a sense of how some philosophical insights can be useful and can be used in practice by scientists. As a sort of, um, let's say, broad follow-up on what Rovelli uh, had written in 2016, uh, in 2019, I decided to coordinate that paper, Why Science Needs Philosophy, which I think is the reason why I'm here today. This is because Professor Majumdar uh, saw that paper and thought that you might be interested in knowing more about it. So we put together uh, an interdisciplinary group of people with philosophers, for example, Lucy Laplan is a philosopher, also neuroscientists like Ralph Adolf, for example, historians of science like Hazok Chang, Alberto Mentovani, as you probably know, is a major immunologist. Margaret McFall Nye is a major biologist who worked on symbiosis. Carlo Rovelli himself, I introduced him right uh, before uh, this slide. Elliot Sober is also a major philosopher of biology. And what we decided to do is to suggest that there is an urgent need for stronger collaborations between scientists and philosophers. Indeed, we try to show in that paper that philosophers can directly contribute to science most of the time, if not always, in collaboration with scientists. 
we do not believe in the idea that philosophers would, would come to a science and say, oh, we should do that, do that. This can work, but this is very rarely the case. What does work, though, is a very intimate collaboration between philosophers and scientists. And when that happens, it can give very interesting results. This led us in this paper to suggest that maybe in a certain sense, every scientific lab should hire a philosopher. So sorry if it sounds like we are uh, trying to make our um, uh, uh, you know, the young people uh, trained in our labs uh, make them hired in scientific labs. But that, that's not the idea. The idea is that for the own interest of the scientific lab, it can be useful to have one or two philosophers who are going to participate in the activities of the lab. What kind of interventions can philosophers do and what kind of interventions do they do in practice? Very often, Philosophers are useful to make some conceptual clarification. Philosophers are experts in concepts, so to speak. What they do is to constantly think about the concepts we use, for example, in science, and suggest that we can redefine them in new and interesting ways. Second, they can make critical assessment of scientific assumptions or methods. Of course, these different tools or interventions I am describing now can perfectly be done by scientists. It's just a question of how much time you have and where your main background is that will, will lead us rather to do more experiments, for example. This is what happens in our lab. Biologists do more experiments. Will philosophers do more of a conceptual clarification, critical assessment of scientific assumptions, etc., etc., etc. But in fact, we work together. And here, this is more a continuum than a division between philosophy and science. The third possible intervention done by philosophers or conceptually inclined scientists is the formulation of new concepts and theories. And the fourth, which is also extremely important, is the connection between different sciences. Philosophers are never uh, true experts in one scientific domain. They can know quite a lot about it, as I think I do in immunology, even though I'm certainly not as good as a professional immunologist, but what is important is that we constantly read in different domains. So we read a little bit of evolution, a little bit of ecology, a little bit of immunology, a little bit of microbiology. And we try to suggest sometimes to our colleagues, for example, in my case in immunology, that if they read a little bit of immunology and evolution, they can find new ideas that they can try to test in the lab. So you see the objective of that paper was very simple, but we think very important. It was to give examples, and in fact, we give four main examples in that paper of very strong, tight collaborations between philosophers and science that led to contributions that some scientists recognized as important for their own field. Just one example, my very good friend, Lucy Laplan, so the first author uh, uh, of this paper, together with uh, Paolo Mantovani, Lucy Laplan is a specialist of cancer stem cells. And very strikingly, when she published her book on cancer stem cells at Harvard University Press a few years ago, Hans Clevers, one of the very big names about uh, 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 stem cells in the world, uh, wrote um, uh, uh, a book review in Nature, in the journal Nature, saying that um, this philosopher, Lucy Laplane, might have changed the field in very important ways. So you see, this is one example, cancer stem cells, where defining things and critically assessing things can be very helpful for the scientific domain itself. So how do we implement that in practice, this interdisciplinarity between philosophy and science uh, in Bordeaux, France, where I work? So this is very simple. What we do is that we developed this idea that we don't do so much what is usually called philosophy of science. We rather do something that we call philosophy in science. What does it mean? It simply means that we suggest that it is very important to have embedded philosophers. So this is exactly what we do in our a lab. We have a very classic immunology lab where uh, one uh, group focuses on gamma delta T cells, another group focuses on autoimmune diseases, another on cancer immunology, 
and inflammation in cancer. And our group is called Conceptual Biology and Medicine, and we are completely embedded in that lab. And what we do in the lab is that we construct a common culture. We read papers together. We sometimes even read a book together to think collectively about a given issue, and we try to make progress together in a given science and for a given scientific problem. So the general idea is that it is possible to use philosophy as a sort of toolbox to advance science. So mainly what we do is that we co-write papers in science journals, and we do that because philosophy has been used as one of our tools for making progress in science. In a certain sense, with my colleagues, we suggest that it is a little bit similar to mathematics. Mathematics in biology are often used as a tool to make progress, and that tool has some flexibility. It is certainly not possible for mathematics to lead you to write a full paper about biology. You need some biological data, you need some biological thinking, but mathematics can be very helpful to formalize your thought and to present your thought in a certain way. And we believe that philosophy, at least in some circumstances, is something of the same sort. You realize why I'm saying this, that the kind of philosophy I'm talking about is not necessarily what most people have in mind when they think about philosophy. For example, many people think about ethics or metaphysics. I think that ethics and metaphysics are very important fields of philosophy, and they can even be very useful for scientists, no doubt. But what we do is different. What we do is to think about philosophy not so much in terms of topics, what is it about, but rather in terms of methods. The methodology of philosophy, at least since Socrates and, and Plato, has been a, method, uh, a methodology of thinking about the fundamental concepts and thinking about constantly critically assessing what we think we believe is true. So we are trying to consider philosophy as a set of methods that can be applied to science. So do not be surprised if in my talk you don't hear something about a very traditional philosophical question, for example, what is good, what is bad. It's not because I don't think this is useful, it's just because the kind of philosophy we are promoting and using in our lab is defined on this methodological basis that I just described. And again, what we want to do is not to respond to classic philosophical problems. It is to use philosophy as a set of methods to try to contribute to progress in science. So you see, this is pretty different. And both are very important and they are very complementary. So in our case, uh, we created this feeding biomed network that Professor Majumdar pr uh, 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 presented before. Uh, so this uh, philosophy in biology and medicine network that now has 12 institutions in the world. And these 12 institutions uh, agree with uh, Bordeaux that what is very important at the moment is to put together philosophy and uh, science. Our interventions are at several levels. Philosophy in science is not just about intervening in uh, the interpretation of scientific results. It is also, and I would say even more importantly, it is also intervening upstream in the way we design our experimental programs. This is not something which is easy to do, but we have found after some years of experience that this is where we are most useful. When someone in the lab starts thinking about a new research program, we intervene and we help these people to frame the question in the most, in the clearest and the most fruitful way. And for that, thinking conceptually, thinking in terms of connecting to different disciplines, thinking about putting what you think into a more coherent framework, which is also informed by what has been said in the past, for example, we have found by experience that that was where uh, we were the most useful for our uh, scientific colleagues. So our interventions are at all these different levels. Our conceptual biology and medicine team in Bordeaux 
is very interdisciplinary. We are a small team, as you can see here on the picture. We have two medical doctors, one biologist, and four, I think now five philosophers of science specialized in philosophy of biology or philosophy of medicine. And this is with that team that we try to intervene in science in the way I just described. We are truly embedded in the lab. This is one of us, Martin, who is working with Alina, who is a biologist and he's a philosopher. And really we are in the lab in a very concrete and immediate sense working together. The four main projects on which we work in uh, our team are key conceptual and theoretical questions in immunology. I'm going to say a few words about that later in this, in this talk. Um, second, interactions between the microbiota development and immunity, which was the central question for my ERC-founded project, IDEM. Third, we work on cancer. Uh, we try to define the tumor microenvironment and we try to find the connection between multicellularity and cancer by putting cancer in a very general evolutionary context. And fourth, we are investigating conceptual models of health, disease, and aging. 70% roughly of our publications are in science journals and medical journals, not philosophy journals. The second part of my talk is that to some extent, philosophy and science have reconnected or never were never completely uh, divorced in the recent past. And this is something that we have demonstrated recently on the basis of some bibliometric evidence. We published this paper, uh, it's just been accepted in one of the main journals in philosophy of science. Don't worry if you've never heard about the name of this journal. This is just because we philosophers of science are a very small community, which is most of the time very much invisible to the scientist. This is a shame, but this is the way it works. In that journal, the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, we suggested that it was important to ask this question, can philosophers of science permeate through science and can they contribute to produce scientific knowledge? And this is work that I did with my friend and colleague, Maël uh, Lemoyne, Madi Kalfawi, and Yves Gingras. We show in that paper that there are three categories uh, to understand how philosophers can uh, permeate science. First, they can publish paper in science journals. This is in itself quite a challenge, as you can imagine. Second, they can be cited in science journals, either for published for papers they published in science journals or for papers they published in philosophy of science journals. After all, sometimes a paper published by a philosopher in a philosophy of science journal is cited in science journals. It's rare, but it happens. The third, which is even more difficult, is contribution. Contribution means that a philosopher has done a scientifically significant proposal. And what we did is to do some bibliometric analysis that led us to prove that intervention, visibility, and contribution existed to an important degree in uh, the connection between philosophy and science. So intervention, I'm going to be quick here, is really the idea that a significant number of philosophers of science have published in science journals. Here you see examples of philosophers who have published much more in science journals than in philosophy journals. So for example, Barry Smith has published 21 uh, times more papers in science journals than in philosophy journals. In itself, it doesn't say much. It, it just says that philosophers of science are not completely um, isolated. Philosophers of science at least some of them try to publish in science. And when you take the 100 most cited philosophers of science in philosophy of science journals, so the, those who are the dominant in their own domain of philosophy of science, 78% of them have published at least once in, science, in a science journal, 58 at least twice, 29 at least five times. So th this is something which we believe is interesting. Philosophers of science are not completely isolated. They try to publish in science journals. And there, there is a significant number of them who has done that. Second, visibility. 
We have uh, defined the notion, which is a notion which is already used in bibliometric uh, analysis, which is the average rate of citation. And here the idea is that you can compare the arc of a given paper to the average number of citations that papers of the same age in the same journal got. So if you have an arc in science, which is above one, it means that you are cited more than the average number of citations in that journal in that year. So here again, the details are not that important. What we did in our analysis in the paper I mentioned before uh, is that we focused on the, 20, uh, the 229 of the most visible papers uh, defined by the fact that they have an arc in science which is above one and they have at least 20 citations in science journals. And these are, of course, papers published uh, by philosophers of science in science journals. And we um, saw that the average uh, arc in science for these uh, papers in 2.19. And here you can find uh, examples which uh, are uh, very important examples of papers written by philosophers of science, for example, by Arthur Fine or uh, Shadow Freshet or Kim Sturelny, and these papers are cited more than 10 times more than the average number of scientific papers written by scientists in the same journal at the same time. So it shows that at least a number, not necessarily many, but a number of papers published by philosophers of science in science journals are very much cited by scientists. So of course, these are very interesting examples. And they are very diverse, as you can see. Brian Skirms uh, uh, works on uh, uh, evolution game theory, for example, which is very different from uh, Fine working on Bell inequalities. So a lot of diversity here. Third, we have demonstrated that there are examples of uh, um, work done by philosophers of science and published in science journals, which have been very contributive. What does it mean? It means that scientists have recognized, acknowledged that this work done by philosophers have been very important for science itself. There are different types of scientific contributions. The most impressive type is new scientific results. For example, David Malament, which you can see here on the top left, is a philosopher of physics who offered to physics a new theorem, which is extremely important, and which you can find now in textbooks, for example, and in many papers it is mentioned uh, uh, often together with uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, theorem, but this is in fact an extension of Stephen Hawking's uh, theorem. And this is very interesting to see that this result by a philosopher has been completely integrated into science as a normal scientific result, even though this is very striking to see a philosopher who manages to write a new theorem and to show how important it is for uh, the field uh, in which it, he works. Uh, there are other examples of scientific, uh, new scientific results, even sometimes some new observations or new experiments. For example, this is the case with Wakefield in the field of uh, psychiatry. Often philosophers do not um, uh, provide new scientific results because this is very rare and very difficult. But in many cases, they provide science with new tools and that can be very important. For example, if you work in the domain of biomedical ontology, you have necessarily heard about Barry Smith, who is a philosopher and who played a decisive role in the construction of many of those biomedical ontologies. And sometimes philosophers also uh, offer new conceptual tools. For example, this is the case with uh, David Hall or with uh, Wilson and Sauber together, uh, a, a biologist and a philosopher. Daniel Sober is the philosopher I, I mentioned before, one of the most important and famous philosophers of biology. And sometimes more modestly, but this is still very important, uh, philosophers participate in a scientific debate and bring something to that debate. So true contributions to science by philosophers of science are rare. I'm not going to lie here. This is very rarely the case that a philosopher is going to be a game changer in science. But this is also true 
that the vast majority of scientific contributions by scientists are not game changers. Let's be honest about it. Most of what is published in science is not a game changer. So it's not surprising that contributions to science by philosophers of science are pretty rare if you have such a, a standard or such a criterion for determining what is a scientific contribution. What we did late, let, let, in the next step in that paper is to say it's not because you are published in the science journals, cited in the science journal, and that you are considered as having made a contribution to science, that you are really philosophy in science. Indeed, to be part of what we call philosophy in science, you have to start with the scientific problem, and then you have to use philosophical tools to provide a scientific proposal. So what we did is to use those three steps as criteria for filtering among the papers we had found and we called permeating papers, we um, uh, used that filter to determine which ones were philosophy in science papers. So basically the idea is that when you do philosophy in science, you connect science and philosophy in a very specific way. You're not just talking about science as most philosophy of science does, under the guise of philosophy on science. When you do philosophy on science, the way we understand it, for example, you're gonna ask, what is a scientific theory? What is a scientific explanation? How does science progress, et cetera, et cetera. These questions are very important, but they do not start with a scientific problem. This is not a question that scientists want to address in their daily work. This is something they can think about, but this is not something they want to address in their daily work. Very few scientists go to the lab every morning saying, oh, I'm going to try to solve the problem of what a scientific explanation is. No, this is not what they do. Philosophy and science is more like that. Philosophy and science start with a scientific problem, a problem that scientists themselves consider as a problem they address in their daily work. And then philosophy in science, as I said before, uses these cogs to connect philosophy to science by providing a scientific proposal that might be useful for scientists in their own domain. So we have found some interesting results with this bibliometric analysis. We found 177 papers that we analyzed in details, and we showed that what is striking with these papers is that you see in those papers philosophers who consider that scientists are their peers rather than philosophers of science themselves. These papers are papers that really take up a scientific question and provide a scientific proposal to that uh, problem with the use of these philosophical tools and in a way that tries to completely be integrated into science itself. So these are examples of uh, those papers. And in fact, I can tell you about one example, uh, an example I alluded to before, um, the work of Wilson and Sauber, uh, published in 1989, about the concept of superorganism. This is called reviving the superorganism. And this paper is very interesting because, indeed, it raises a scientific problem. That scientific problem is, can group selection exist and can natural selection act at the level of superorganisms? It uses philosophical tool, especially the philosophical tool of questioning consistency because the paper shows an inconsistency in the dominant idea that the organism can be a unit of selection while the group cannot be a group of selection. And it makes a scientific proposal by offering a precise and testable hypothesis about selection occurring at the level of superorganisms. And they illustrate that with examples, they even suggest a novel experiment. This is, this is just one example of something suggested by a philosopher and a scientist in that case, which proved to be useful for the scientific domain uh, in question. We have all heard about uh, uh, big claims about uh, philosophy being completely useless. This is, for example, what uh, Steven Weinberg did in this uh, book, Dreams of a Final Theory, where he's pretty harsh on philosophers being completely useless. And this is a fair critique. I mean, a lot of philosophy is indeed useless for science, but maybe some of the aims of philosophers are orthogonal to being useful to science. What I'm trying to show here is that at least a sub part of philosophy 
can be useful to science. So what we did in, with our paper was to show that there is a community of philosophers in science which has a major impact on uh, several issues. This discovery has a major impact on several issues which have been central to philosophy of science throughout its history. Our philosophy of science and science continues. We show that it is more continuous than most people believe. Is philosophy of science useful to science? We show that it can be useful in a number of cases. Does a philosophy that permeates through science ipso facto cease to be philosophy? We show in our paper that uh, it is perfectly possible for a result uh, suggested by a philosopher to be both scientifically important and philosophically important. One example here is the work of David Hall, for example, on individuality and the units of selection. This goes back to an idea of Hazok Chang, who is a wonderful historian of science who work, works at Cambridge University and in different books and papers, including in this great book, Inventing Temperature, um, Hasak Chang suggests that history and philosophy of science can be seen as the continuation of science by other means. And he suggests that you can be a scientist by doing some history and philosophy of science. And I think this is a very good point made by Hasak Chang. So we come to the same conclusion with very different arguments. Our arguments are more based on bibliometric analysis and on philosophical analysis. Hasak Chang's arguments are many historical and they are great arguments based on fantastic examples. We also did this complementary paper, The Visibility of Philosophy of Science in the Sciences, and this is done with the same authors and published in the journal Synthes, where we were interested in where philosophy of uh, science uh, um, um, papers uh, are cited, by which domains they are cited. And as you can see here, 30% of the citations uh, of philosophy of science papers are in philosophy of science journals, which is in fact very low. Most domains are uh, less scattered, less diverse in where they are cited than uh, philosophy of science. So that diagram is useful to get that idea. We also have this very interesting network diagram where we show um, what are the journals that cite the main uh, philosophy of science journals? And this is very interesting here again to see that many scientific journals do cite philosophy of science journals. I'm going to end this uh, presentation by giving you one presentation, one example, sorry, of something which is going on in our lab and consists in connecting philosophy and immunology. So this is just one example. But I think this is an important example to get in practice the kind of work that we do when connecting philosophy and science. This amounts to questioning the question of the connection between immunology and individuality. And as Professor Majumdar said in the beginning of his presentation, my own work has been about thinking about this very notion of self and also the notion of non-self which are so important in immunology and which are so striking for a philosopher because those notions are philosophical and psychological notions that have been imported into immunology. So uh, when I started this work many years ago, I was so surprised by this that I decided to do some investigations and to try to see what I could offer as a way of thinking the immune system in a different way. So it is very important to understand the key role, the concept of individuality in the birth of immunology. Immunology as a science was really constructed through the, the years, but it became officially, so to speak, a science mainly in the years, uh, well, in the 1920s, mainly, and then in the 1930s. And immunology was born by the conjunction of two different domains. Transplantation studies, especially after the First World War, and studies about contagious diseases. And the idea was that by putting together these two fields, which hitherto appear to be very different, we can put together immunology under this very label of individuality. 
The idea is that the immune system tells us something about the unity of the organism, the boundaries of the organism, and about the uniqueness of each organism. And the idea is that when you try to do a transplantation, or when you see how a microbe can affect an organism, in fact, what you see is the response of that organism in terms of individuality. And this is exactly what led uh, uh, Frank McFann and Bennett uh, the, 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 the very famous um, Australian virologist who uh, invented the self-non-self uh, theory, this is what led him to suggest that the good notion, the most appropriate notions to think about this individuality were exactly the notions of self and non-self. Of course, this is a long story with many, many important actors at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, but very clearly, Bonnet played a crucial role here. And very interestingly, Bonnet, and you can see a picture here, through a series of papers and books, really managed to show that in his view, the immune system was about the acceptance of self and the rejection of non-self. Everything that belongs to the self is going to be accepted or tolerated by the immune system, while everything which is foreign to the organism is going to count as non-self and therefore is going to be rejected by the immune system. And that would explain why, even though accepting a graft would be useful, we're going to reject that graft if it is an allograft because it is something that conflicts with our own self. And of course, this uh, became a very famous reflection of Bennett in his book in 1962, The Integrity of the Body, and in this other book in 1969, Self and Not Self. Interestingly, Bennett was very much inspired by philosophy when he uses the word self. In fact, he found the idea in a very famous book of the time by Wells, Axley and Wells, Everyone was reading this book by then, and now it's a little bit a shame that this book has been forgotten, The Science of Life, 1929. Bennett read that book, and the final chapter of that book is about psychology, and mainly about the way we can talk about a psychological self, a psychological unity and identity uh, of organisms. And in fact, the very concept of self, of the self, in Western thought comes from uh, John Locke in his essay on human understanding in, in 1693. So we can show that very clearly um, this self non self idea comes from psychology and before that from philosophy. So you can see really a, a affiliation uh, from philosophy to psychology to biology. And indeed, Burnett often insisted that self non self was also a philosophical question. And here is another uh, important philosopher who inspired uh, 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 Burnett, uh, who was uh, Whitehead uh, in the UK. So there are many problems with uh, the self non self as a framework. And uh, in my work, what I try to do is to think about all these exceptions or problems with the self non self, including the fact that there are some immune responses to cancerous tumors. Also, the big challenge of autoreactivity and normal autoimmunity. And third, the challenge of immune tolerance, for example, the tolerance of the fetus by the mother and also tolerance to the microbiota. I'm not going to go into the details here, but a lot of my work has been about showing that the self-non-self framework, as it was suggested by Burnett, cannot work for both experimental and conceptual reasons. It is a fascinating framework. It is a very rich framework, and it was so useful for immunology. But when data accumulate in the 1980s, 1990s, beginning of the years 2000, it becomes clear that this framework is at least partly inadequate. And I was very interested in trying to help showing what was problematic in that framework. And this is where you can see that philosophy can be useful because it helps us to be more specific, more precise about what's going on somewhere when we can all see that there is a tension or a problem in the framework that is the dominant framework in a given science. And what I did in my work was to say that the self-non-self, -self, 
was both a theory, a scientific theory, and also a conceptual framework that was supposed to account for biological individuality. So what I did is I said, if we want to criticize the self, non-self, then we absolutely need to build another conceptual framework to account for biological individuality. And also we need to build another immunological theory. And this is what I tried to do. I'm going to say a few words about the first point, and I'm going to skip the second point. If you're interested, it is easy to find out what I tried to say about this. And you can tell me later by email, for example, if you're interested and if you're, in, if you're convinced by uh, that aspect. So another conceptual framework to account for biological individuality. Basically, what I did is work with uh, a very uh, important biologist, for example, my very good friend Gérard Hébert, who is at the Pasteur Institute. And what we uh, insisted upon was the idea that every organism is, is in fact a complex and partly microbial community. Uh, each of us is a complex community made of many biotic elements belonging to different species and even to different kingdoms. We all host huge number of resident microbes. And in fact, these are bacteria, but also viruses and fungi. They are in the gut, but also on all bodies interfaces. And what is in important is first that when I say we, it's not just humans, it's the vast majority of living things are in fact chimera in this sense, chimeras in this sense. That is, they have some, they tolerate some foreign material, which is mainly microbial. And the second thing, which I think is absolutely crucial, is that some of these microbes play a functional, sometimes indispensable role in the organism, for example, in terms of digestion, metabolism, immunity, development, maybe brain function and behavior. And what is crucial for my point is that these microbes are not just there, not visible to the immune system. They are not rejected by the immune system, even though the immune system sees them, can interact with them. So what I did in my work was to suggest that every uh, organism is a multi-species community, but a strongly unified community. So we are sort of a, a microbial and eukaryotic and et cetera, et cetera, community strongly unified by something. And this something I suggest is the immune system. I think the immune system plays a decisive role in unifying the different constituents of the organism, including components of the microbiome. So the immune system, I believe, is a system of inclusion, of exclusion, but the immune system is not going to base its view about what is supposed to stay inside and what is not supposed to stay inside on the question of the origins of the entity. To say things more simply, I don't think that the immune system is a system of detection of self and non-self in the sense of determining if something comes from the inside of the organism or comes from the outside of the organism. In fact, very often we tolerate something that comes from the outside, many microbes, for example. And also very often we reject immunologically something that comes from the inside, even if we're not talking here about autoimmune diseases. So, for example, we constantly eliminate some components via phagocytosis and many other processes, which are a way of immunologically eliminating components which comes from the inside. So I think that from this point of view, the immune system plays a sort of e pluribus unum role by really const constantly unifying components which are diverse and different uh, including some microbial components. And this is true across species. The conclusion is that every organism is an immunologically unified chimera in my own reconstruction of immunology. And this is what I call heterogeneous individuality. I also suggested, as I said before, a new way of thinking about theories in immunology. And this is mainly, I'm going to skip that. This is what we called, especially with my colleague and friend, Eric Vivier, who is a very famous immunologist uh, uh, in Marseille. We call that the discontinuity theory of immunity. So it's a long process. It started in 2006. And we developed this theory, which in a nutshell is simply saying that what matters for the immune system is the rate of antigenic change rather than 
uh, uh, non-self in itself. So this is what is important is the sudden modification of the molecular patterns with which immunoreceptors interact. We created a model of that, including a mathematical model, and I don't want to go into the details. I will go to my conclusion. What I wanted to say simply is that when you hear a philosopher, a philosopher talking about science, sometimes you can find what he or she say is very abstract, and sometimes what we say is indeed very abstract. But what I wanted to um, show today is that we can, in fact, intervene in scientific material which is very precise, including the scientific theory, including by making new testable predictions, for example. We can do that provided that we know the science we are talking about, we work with very good and open-minded scientists, and we take the view that philosophy can be useful to suggest something new. Again, it doesn't work each time we try it, but it can work sometimes, and this is what I try to do by using philosophy to make progress in immunology. So, a novel approach to biological individuality, I think, is possible and can be helped by uh, a philosophy. And this is what led me to suggest that organisms, most organisms, can be seen as immunologically unified chimeras. We can also suggest a novel theoretical approach for immunology based on some conceptual and philosophical reflection. And I think something which is also underlying everything I told you today is that it is important in science to redefine concepts, even concepts which are central to immunology. I think this is very important. We don't want to define to get a definition that is going to paralyze the field. It's not a definitive definition. We suggest that definitions are important, but they need to constantly change. So we need to define and redefine and redefine. So never to paralyze our thought and consider that we have a definition, we must stick to that definition. No, what is important is to constantly realize that the concepts we use in science do matter for the kind of questions we raise and the kind of experiments we do and also the kind of therapeutic options that we try to do in the clinic, for example. So those concepts are very important. What difference does philosophy make to science? Conceptual and theoretical contributions, I think, are important. And such reflections about theories, concepts, and methods can have some experimental and clinical consequences. And I think that some philosophers, at least, offer a model of philosophy in science which can inspire, I think, a new generation of philosophers and scientists. So if I manage to convince at least one person that it is important to do philosophy and science together, then I think I will have succeeded in what I wanted to do today. And with this, I really want to thank the people whose names appear on the, on the, on the screen, and I really want to thank you for your attention. Thomas, thank you very much. That was uh, just a fantastic uh, lecture. Um, I've almost gotten convinced that uh, you know your your tribe and my tribe are not so different. <laughs> we ask very similar questions. Um, you 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 said that philosophers on a daily basis ask for scientific explanations. Um, some scientists also do that, and you ask you said that you look for uh, unified themes. You look for discrepancies consistencies and all of that, uh, even in, as scientists, we do that uh, very often. Uh, as a matter of fact, I might say that uh, all the time because we are looking for outliers that actually can uh, help explain certain kinds of phenomena or at least uh, you know provide the unification. Uh, we do not have too much of time, so I'm not going to ask, uh, uh, get many questions uh, to ask you, but there is a question on the chat box that I'll read out to you. Uh, and this question is uh, from one of the two secretaries of the academy, Professor Rene Borges, and uh, she's asking, would you say that logic as a discipline needs to be incorporated into science curricula? Wouldn't the most useful part of philosophy for science be contributed by logic? This is a wonderful question. I think logic should be part of the training of most scientists, if not all. So I think it's an excellent point. So yeah, this is very important and philosophers study logic and this is very useful for them. I think many scientists do not study logic and I think that could be very useful for, for them. Then there's the second question, which is, is that the part of philosophy and of philosophy of science, which is the most useful? I would say yes, if you define logic uh, extensively enough. So what I mean by that is that logic in itself is really about the uh, 
you know, offering very coherent and very good uh, rezoning. And I think that is very important. But as I showed you, um, the diversity of things that philosophers can do, for example, by criticizing some assumptions can be done by logic, but it can also be differently. So again, depending on how you define logic, logic is going to be the whole thing I'm talking about or not. If you have a narrower definition of logic, I would add different aspects, uh, which can also be important. I also alluded to the fact that sometimes what philosophers do is to question metaphysical assumptions of science. And that is often not done with logic, even though it can be done sometimes with logic. So you see, I think logic the best way to answer is to say logic will be one of the most important parts of the way philosophy of science can be useful for science. That would be my short answer. So before we end, there are no further questions in the chat box. Before we end, uh, may I ask a question, which is, uh, what do you think are the distinguishing features of a philosopher who uh, indulges in philosophy in science contrasted with a scientist herself or himself? Again, wonderful question. I think often I would be tempted to say, well, there's no difference. It's just a continuum. And I do think that this is really a continuum. And I think this continuum idea is my main idea. It's just that for reasons, for practical reasons, I have to fight people who think that there is a strong divide. So very often I have to say, oh, you as a philosopher, you do that. You as a scientist, you do that. But in fact, I am convinced that we are part of the same continuum. So what are the main characteristics of a philosopher? The main characteristics are questions of degree, not question of, um, of uh, you know, uh, of yes, no, not, not yes, no questions. So, for example, the way we are trained to think critically about concepts, I think that is something that we do very easily as philosophers just because of our training. Why, for example, when we try to do experiments, which we sometimes try to do in my lab, we are not very good at doing experiments. So, you know, there is this uh, there is this thing where the continuum is real, but it is more or less easy for scientists or for philosophers to do those different tasks. Some scientists are brilliant at thinking critically about their field and suggesting new concepts, but some of them don't like to do that. And we are here to help and say, well, we like thinking in terms of concepts. Maybe we can work together to achieve an interesting and important result. So that is really a question of degree and a question of facility, easiness in doing the different tasks which are part of philosophy and science together, in my view. That's a wonderful place to stop. Uh, and uh, really very, very grateful to you, uh, Professor uh, Prado, for this wonderful talk. And uh, you know, it really brought lots of thoughts in uh, many of us who were listening intently to your talk. and. This continuum is what uh, came through your talk very, very, uh, very well. And so we are very grateful. Thank you very much. Uh, we hope that uh, you will be able to visit India uh, sometime. And uh, it's an open invitation to you for uh, visiting our academy, the Indian Academy of Science uh, in, in Bangalore. Thank you very much for engaging with us. And it was just absolutely uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, really. The, the honor is mine, as I said, and it was real pleasure to interact with you. Thank you so much, and I wish you the best for the, for the, the rest of your uh, uh, exchanges and talks. Thank you so much. <laughs>